Container shipping is responsible for moving 90% of the world's goods. Most of it is in metal boxes like these. You can have hundreds of items from hundreds of different companies in one container. And so it really is a logistics marvel. But if shipping containers aren't in the right place at the right time, problems may unfold. Those containers would normally be off in one to two days, but it's been a week and they're still here. It's crops that are going to waste. The supply chain is not there. You know, it's just not. Congestion at the ports, it limits the availability of those coveted containers. It then inflates the pricing. All of this is indeed being passed over to the consumers. People suddenly realize how important that container is to everybody's standard of living, really, to be honest with you. By my calculations, if you take the value of everything that moves in container shipping, it works out to $937 per year per person on the planet. Shipping containers support the flow of global trade. We are kind of the hidden secret in the background that tries to make sure that everything is everywhere available. Just as China leads the world in exports, it also leads in container manufacturing. One way or another, half the world's merchant marine fleet owes its existence to China. Here's how shipping containers can save or cripple the global economy. Supply chain disruptions can have big ramifications for American shoppers and have a major impact on inflation. They have contributed on average about 60% of the run-up of U.S. inflation from 2021 to 2023. However, avoiding disruptions isn't that simple. The skill involved in containerization is moving that container from point A to point B and getting it back to point A as quickly and efficiently as you possibly can. A bottleneck in the supply chain can shake up the availability of shipping containers. We have a more than adequate global supply. The reason why the supply of containers becomes a problem is because of events. And as a result, you do have a fear of containers being in locations where they can't be filled. For example, the situation in the Red Sea. Iran-backed Houthi militants on ships in the Red Sea are continuing to wreak havoc on global trade. Hundreds of large vessels are now rerouting around the southern tip of Africa, adding 10 to 15 days onto their journeys. With longer voyages tying up containers, prices may increase. So they're not going to pay the Suez toll, and they're going to just pass on the higher charges to their customer to go that extra, what is it, the three weeks to go around Africa. Longer shipping routes are only one bottleneck. The coronavirus pandemic led to multiple bottlenecks along the supply chain. Every single chain of the supply chain was diminished. You had delays in China because less people manufacturing the product. And then once it got to a port, you had less people moving those containers. Labor and manufacturing issues caused supply bottlenecks. But at the same time, demand for goods surged as people turned to online shopping. There were a lot of containers that were needed. As a result, we had the shortage of containers. With demand outweighing supply, freight rates surged in 2021 and 2022. Prices skyrocketed to about $30,000 a container. From China to a West Coast port like LA or Long Beach, prices have more than doubled. This also impacted U.S. exports. Now this is actually causing a huge problem for U.S. companies because it's now so lucrative for shipping companies and leasing firms who control the boxes that they'd rather send the cargo containers back to China empty rather than them go somewhere inside the United States to pick up food or other exports. It was more profitable to ship empty containers back to China as soon as possible, which weighed on farmers looking to sell their crop before it went bad. The logistics just don't exist to get the fresh vegetables to those who need it. Instead, it's all being plowed under. Prices are now around three to $4,000 per 40-foot shipping container. The market is returning to more normality. Historically, container shipping has been a very low margin, low profit industry. It's just these last few years, complete outliers. Before the shipping container as we know it today, global trade looked a lot different. If you go back 150 years or so ago, it was really the biggest industry. Luxury goods which are today helping the French to put up a gallant front to the world. Ships were much smaller, and the cost of loading and unloading a ship was quite significant. It was very, very labor intensive. It's a real achievement on the part of Moore McCormick and other land, sea, and air transport industries that they've been able to keep the goods moving as fast as our farms and factories turn it out. Shipping something 
you know, would easily add 50 or 100 percent, 200 percent to the cost of the goods. The invention of the container really wasn't that long ago. Only U.S. style speed, service and efficiency. I worked for 20 years with Malcolm McLean, the gentleman who invented container shipping back in 1956. Malcolm McLean pioneered the shipping container we know today, shepherding in the era of globalization, containerization and its standardization. With that idea, transportation became a commodity, right? And it became so much easier to handle, and it also became so much cheaper. All containers are standardized, and that's why we call them 20-foot equivalent units. 20-foot equivalent, AKA TEU. Take the Ever Given, the cargo ship that got jammed in the Suez Canal, as an example. Stuck in Egypt's Suez Canal, clogging one of the busiest shipping routes in the world. That ship has 20,388 TEU capacity. Container growth was always kind of some multiple of GDP, often two or three times. There was a big spike in containerization. When China joined the WTO, all that manufacturing went out to Asia. China is the number one maker and supplier of containers. Over 95% of containers are produced in China. And the three leading producers in China are China International Marine Containers. There's Dongfang International Containers, which is related to the Costco Group, which also runs shipping lines and ports and terminals. And then we've got a company called CXIC. Steel is one of the key materials used to make containers. Container manufacturing in China makes sense when considering it's a leader in steel production and China's status as the largest export market in the world. The factory of the world is in Asia. That's where things are generally made. And we buy things in North America. We don't make things so much. So if you're not making things, you've got nothing to send back. There are two dominant buyers of containers, ocean carriers and leasing companies. Ever since the industry has been in place, the ranges have been very, very close. The leasing companies at about 48%. And the other, the transport operators and the ocean carriers, at about 52%. When ocean carriers order ships, they often buy more containers at the same time. Or companies will place an order for containers to replace aging containers. On the ocean carrier side, you've got the companies like AP Moller Merce Group's Merce Line, MSC Shipping Mediterranean Shipping Company uh, based in Geneva, Evergreen Line based in Taiwan, Hapag Lloyd in Germany, CMA CGM in France, Costco Shipping Group in China, Ocean carriers can also lease shipping containers. Global lease companies that also operate fleets of containers that they lease out to either steamship lines. We actually have uh, leased containers. The main leasing companies that are buying containers are Triton International, Textainer, Florence, CQ and Seaco. The U.S. government is taking action to strengthen supply chains, including the shipping container market. One of the factors affecting prices is this. Nine major shipping companies consolidated into three alliances control the vast majority of ocean shipping in the world. Furniture, appliances, clothing, anything and everything across the Pacific on a ship from Asia saw a price tag shoot up. While families and businesses struggled around the world, these carriers made $190 billion in profit in 2021. In addition, these foreign-owned carriers have also been refusing to carry American-made products back to Asia. It hurts the entire economy. The commissioner of the Federal Maritime Commission issued a report about China's container manufacturing, writing, it should be alarming that of the 44.2 million maritime container global inventory, over 95% are manufactured in China. Nowadays, it is a fact that uh, most of the ocean capacity is controlled outside of the U.S. Is that a problem? In my personal humble point of view, um, no, because I think where those companies uh, having their head office are not necessarily countries that we would be worried about. The U.S. government is more concerned that there's always enough capacity for the U.S. exporters to carry cargo to market. The industry is expanding production into other Asian countries. I think the industry as a whole would welcome an alternative to the Chinese dominant position in container manufacturing. India is also investing in some container factories and there are investments now in Vietnam. 
you know, Vietnam during the COVID did struggle to find sufficient amount of equipment to move some of their exports. I think that has coloured the government strategy to support the development of these container factories, apart from Vietnam and, and maybe elsewhere in Asia. I do not see any shift really, or certainly in the short term, from China dominating this industry. Demand for shipping containers is likely to grow. Whatever happens in globalization, you will always see that the transport by container is usually growing with that. But so far, over the last 30 years that I'm in this market, containerization has, over a longer period of time, always grown. Globalization is still the way to go for many. Decide where to manufacture certain goods, where to sell those goods, or where to source the raw materials from.